Okay, so it's a great pleasure to introduce the, the third speaker this morning, uh, Elmar Schro from Leibniz University uh, and uh, at, in Hanover. And uh, I mean, uh, he, he will talk about the local index formulae, trace expansions, and non commutative residue on an algebra of Fourier integral. So, Elmar, please. Thank you. Thank you very much for the introduction, and thanks a lot to all the organizers for putting together this beautiful conference. It's really been a great pleasure to attend this. Um, what I'd like to speak about is joint work with Anton Savin from um, the People's Friendship University in Moscow. Okay, our, our motivation is the following. We consider a smooth closed manifold M, it could also be RM, and the discrete group, which acts on L2 of M by quant what we call quantized canonical transformations. And then we're interested in the index theory of operators of this form here. So you have a finite sum of pseudo differential operators and these quantized canonical transformations that they call phi sub G. This seems at first a, a rather strange subject, but let me explain a little bit why this is interesting. Let me first say what I'm talking about. We have this quantized canonical transformations. And probably you remember from your physics course that a canonical transformation is a simple ectomorphism. So it's a diffeomorphism of the cotangent bundle with the zero section removed. I indicate this by this little zero here which preserves the symplectic form on T star M, RM. So it's a symplectomorphism. And in addition, it's one homogeneous. So there's a natural R plus action on the fibers of T star M and C respects this um, action. A quantized canonical transformation is a free integral operator, which is associated with the graph of such a canonical transformation. If at the moment it's not clear to you what the quantized canonical transformation is or what the Fourier integral operator is, in this talk, it's mostly going to be about something very really particular and you don't need to know that. Okay. Um, a few examples of canonical transformations that will come up. Of course, if you have a linear symplectic transformation, that's probably the easiest case of a canonical transformation. Another one comes up if you have your base manifold and you have a diffeomorphism on your base manifold, then you can lift this diffeomorphism to the cotangent bundle by, by this formula here that probably all of you have encountered one or another time. It, it naturally comes up when you look at the transformation of differential operators under diffeomorphisms and that's precisely um, what, what happens here. And the third example that's going to come up is when you look at the flow induced by a homogeneous function real valued on the cotangent bundle. So again, I remove the zero section, though I don't say anything here. So it's homogeneous of degree one in the fibers Oh, sorry. So it, it induces a flow. And for every time that you stop the flow, you get a canonical transformation. So that's very easy. OK. Why are we interested in the index theory of this form? Because it's, it's a very general kind of index theory when you're based on pseudo differential operators. Let, let me give a few examples. Suppose you don't have a group at all. So you just have a pseudo differential operator. Then of course, it's the classical index theory of pseudo differential operators. Okay, suppose your sum consists just of the identity here and one of these phi g's. That also has a name, that's the Atiyah Weinstein in index problem. And um, it's an interesting problem in that it was set up, I think, in 76, and uh, the solution was given by Epstein, Merrose, and Leichnam, Ness, and Sigan in, um, in about 2000. Um, so there is an index formula for this uh, operator here, but it's not really known whether there are any operators of index non-zero. Okay, you can do it 
a little bit different. And something very similar comes up in the work of Bea and Strohmeyer. They considered a Dirac operator on the Lorentzian space-time. And of course, this is not an elliptic operator. So it doesn't essentially make sense to speak of an index. But what you can do is the following. You look at the time slice. So you take two times, T1 and T2. And the one time slice, you impose um, a tier part of the Singer boundary conditions. And on the other one, just the opposite ones. And then you get a problem which is fretal and which is um, essentially of this type apart from the projections that you put in. And this phi g then just is the propagator for the, uh, for the Dirac operator. And what has been studied very intensively is the case where these phi g's are given by the free morphisms of, of the manifold. That's what I just mentioned before. They sometimes go under the name of shift operators. And there's a, a wealth of literature on this. For example, Anton Yevich and Lebedev have looked at this, um, Conan Moscovici and Chantal Dave, and Denis Perrault, Raphael Ponge, and many, many others. And when I was saying that this is a rather general index problem, it, it refers to the following. If you have something like this and you want this to be an algebra, then you have to have an action of these, free, of these operators here on the pseudo differential operator. And uh, so there's a, a theorem by Deutsche Martin Singer from 75 or 76, which says, whenever you have an automorphism of the algebra of pseudo differential operators, which preserves the order. So that's an additional condition, but then it's given by conjugation with the quantized canonical transformation. So in this sense, if you want to work with pseudo differential operator, there's not much more you could do. Um, okay, let me just shortly resume what we did before and um, why we came to what I'm talking about today. Of course, you can introduce a notion of ellipticity. So you get the invertibility of, uh, inver sorry, ellipticity is the invertibility of a symbol. And the, the symbol then lives, well, just in the cross product of the continuous function S star M. So that's the symbol of these DGs on which these, um, this group acts, the group that, um, that uh, induces the phi Gs, right? So of course, elliptic operators are fret time operators, otherwise the notion wouldn't make sense. Um, what we can define, we can define localized analytic and algebraic indices for those and they coincide. And in a very similar situation, Gorohovsky, the Klein and Nest obtained an algebraic index theorem for equivariant operators. Um, and yeah, the, the problem is the following. For one thing, if you have these representations, then they might not be unique. And actually um, you might have different symbols for the same operator. This, this situation does not come up if G is amenable and the action is topologically free, but in, in general it does. And also, um, of course you think the algebraic index theorem of the Klein, uh, of the Krakowski, the Klein and Nest should give the same index as this here. And everybody would say, what else should it give? But it's not clear and, uh, and the situation is rather obscure. So what we did, we decided to look at a very concrete example where you can really compute something. And it turned out this was more interesting than we thought in the beginning. So our concrete example is the following. As the manifold, we take Rn. Then it makes sense for, for good reason. You don't work with the standard pseudo differential operators on Rn, but you work with these Shubin type pseudo differential operators on Rn. The, um, the calculus is based on symbols that satisfy this estimate here. So you take the derivatives of a symbol and X and P, so the space variable and the uh, variable in the fiber on the same level. So mm -hmm. you estimate this by one plus the norm of X plus the norm of P to the order N, that's the order of the operator minus the sum of both derivatives. And we work with classical symbols, so they have an asymptotic expansion to homogeneous terms. 
And so they have principal symbols and the principal symbols of course live on the cosphere. So the fear of dimension um, to n minus one and the cotangent space. Okay, these are the differential operators and then we need some, some Fourier integral operators. Well, we take particularly simple one. So for one thing, we take these Heisenberg Weil operators that those are, um, those are similar to those considered by um, Fyodor Sukhachev in, um, in his talk here. So essentially this is a shift operator. So you have a function u, you shift it by a, and you add a phase factor here. So there's an e to the ikx, so read a function and then a pure constant factor from the two components of your variable z in Rn. And you have this uh, relation here, if you multiply tz by tw, then you get tz plus w with an additional phase factor, namely this one here. Okay, this is the first, they very simple operators. And then to have something more complicated, we look at metaplectic operators. Okay, um, and we don't look at all the metaplectic operators, but we just look at the unitary subgroup represented by metaplectic operators. So how do we do this? We notice that um, T star N has a complex structure. Um, simply by mapping xp to p minus ix. There's various ways to do this. And, uh, and then uh, gl of trn is the same as gl of cn, and here you have the unitary group in this. And okay, you have to associate this to this a metaplectic operator. So I'll explain what the metaplectic operator is. Um, so the metaplectic operators are a subgroup of the bounded operators on L2, and it's generated by the i to the i h, where this, or I should say h hat, where h hat is the Weil quantization of a homogeneous real quadratic form on T star n. So there's a difference between remember in this example before I had one homogeneous functions, but now since space and uh, the P variables are on the same level, you look at quadratic forms. So there are two homogeneous here. And um, okay, these generate this, the metaplectic group. You can complexify the whole thing by just adding a, a phase factor of uh, e to the i phi to this where phi is, is any real. Okay, you have various ways of representing the metaplectic group. Um, it was probably introduced by Loré. And uh, if you look at his books so or the book of de Gosson, you find many other ways to see. But this is very convenient for what we do. And what we first notice is um, we start with the real quadratic form. And we, if we take uh, the while operator associated to a real symbol, then you get the self-adjoint operator. And this is of course very convenient because then each of the IH hat is always a unitary operator. So, so that's quite practical. Excuse me, there is a question in the chat. Which ah, is sorry. Why, why complexify the group? What do we gain by doing that? Uh, because basically you work with this UN and uh, you see, okay. Right, the whole thing becomes more complex now. Okay, so I, I hope the answer satisfies the person. Okay. Uh, is, is the motivation of complexification coming because physicists work with exponentials of the, of the IH, of the Hamiltonian? Is this all physics motivated, this mathematical construction? Um, no, we want to have a lifting of this thing and this work. Okay, you'll see in a second. Okay, okay. Um, we, we want to work with the unitary operators and we lift them uh, through the complex metaplectic group. Is that just a few minutes? Uh, maybe the next slide or the one after that. Okay, I'll wait. Thank you. Okay. 
but it's it's not for physical reasons in any case. Okay, um, if you have a metaplectic operator, then you get the symplectic metrics. And that, that's very easy. So you have a metaplectic operator and suppose you take one of the generators. So this is e, this E to the IH hat. And then you have this quadratic form. This quadratic form gives you a Hamiltonian flow and you stop the flow at time one and you get the symplectic transformation. And here you have your symplectic matrix in GL of TRN. And actually this is a rejection into, into the space here. Okay, um, however, the metaplectic group is a non-trivial double covering of the symplectic group. So um, we cannot represent the symplectic matrices by metaplectic operators. But what we can do is the following, we can represent the um, unitaries by them, um, sorry. Okay, um, so if we identify CN with T star N, the unitaries are just the symplectic group with the uh, intersected with the um, O of 2N, so the orthogonal matrices. And you can generate uh, UN by matrices of this form, um, E to the B plus IA, where A is a real symmetric matrix and B is a skew symmetric real n times n matrix. So this is just a standard representation of um, unitary matrices. And the point is you can lift those. So you take a unitary and you lift it and here comes the little C from the, one, from the uh, metaplectic ones. By taking a lift of um, any lift of your metaplectic operator, and you multiply this by the determinant of this G. And this is going to be a, a complex number in general. And the point is, if you do it this way, then it's well-defined. So you start at the identity with the square root of one equal to one, and then you continue this pathwise and it turns out if you do a closed loop, then you arrive at the same point. Basically, this means you go around two pi times and you get a sign of um, e to the two pi i. You take the square root, that's a minus one. And the, the, two, P, the two operators that lie over the same symplectic map are also, um, also just differ by the sign. And, and this is why you get the same thing. Okay, you can write it also a bit more concretely if you say, well, I have this um, quadratic form and it's given by this quadratic matrix. Then the lift of this, um, this quadratic matrix is supposed to be the corresponding operators times this phase factor here. Or in a, in a simpler way, the exponential of minus IH, bar, IH hat multiplied by this phase factor here. So this explains hopefully why, um, why we have this uh, complex metaplectic group. It's okay. I think you should go on, yeah. <laughs> okay. okay. Um, what, what others might know and what's very helpful in these concrete con uh, computations is if you notice that you can generate the uh, unitary operators by um, the orthogonal ones and one U1 action. So where you, where you see U1 as a subgroup of your N, say putting it just in the in the first slot of a diagonal matrix. Then you can move this around by, um, by ON and you obtain all the, all the unitary operators. And then you can look, what does this RG do? What's this representation do? So, and, and there's easy to see, namely if, if, you have an orthogonal, if you have an orthogonal matrix, then this action is just the uh, transformation by this, um, 
orthogonal um, element. On the other hand, if you have something of this form, e to the i phi, then we, what you get is an operator, e to the i phi, and then you have, um, well, one half minus the um, harmonic oscillator in, in the first variable. So here we are only acting the first variable. So you only get the harmonic oscillator, the action in the first variable. And, um, and this you can represent um, concretely. These, these operators are known as fractional Fourier transforms. So um, this you can actually compute. There's a nice paper by Hermann that how to do this uh, analytically correct. And the formula is generally known as Mailer's formula. So if, if you don't have a multiple of two pi, um, uh, a multiple of pi over two, then this is just given by this formula, this, um, this factor here, the square root of one minus i, the cotangent of phi divided by two pi. And then here comes, see your, um, basically your harmonic oscillator times the cotangent over two times, uh, uh, sorry, minus x one y one divide by the sine over this. So um, this, these, these are known as fractional free transforms. You actually see if phi is pi over two, then the cotangent vanishes. So you have just this um, here, this factor of one over square root of two pi and e to the i minus x one y one. Sure, you get and that's just a free transform. Yeah, yeah, sure. Okay, um, so this acts on, on the pseudo differential operators by conjugation. You know, if you take a pseudo differential operator, you uh, conjugate it by one of these RG, you get again a pseudo differential operator. And actually, for the principal symbol, you have this formula here, where the principal symbol of the conjugate operator is given by the application of G inverse to the symbol. Okay. Um, now let's go to non commutative geometry. And uh, what already Henri Moscovici recalled in his talk is the uh, is Kant's joint character that was first defined very abstractly for the case of a graded P summable spectral triple. And um, the Turing Kant character was um, in the even case defined as an element of the even periodic cyclic cohomology. And it's very useful because if you, if you, take, the, um, if you take any projection and um, you take the k-class of the projection, then you get the index of the operator by pairing with this turn character. Okay, the, the definition of this was based on, on the dix meade trace. And uh, of course, it's very abstract. So for no, not the Dixmi trace, no, 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 on the ordinary trace. Uh, in the even case, wasn't it uh, T R omega in your paper? No, no. I mean, uh, it is the Hochschild class which is a Dixmi trace, but not the the thing. Ah, okay. The thing itself is a, is a true trace, and that's why it's difficult to compute. If it had been a Dixmi trace, it would be very easy to compute because it would be local. Okay. No, no, no. It's an ordinary trace, of course. Yeah, sure. Okay, so it's the point is, it's, <laughs> it, it's difficult to compute. So um, what was a, a progress was the formula by um, the work by Kahn and Moscovici that has been improved um, a little later on by, by Hickson and Kerry Phillips, Rennie and Sukhachev. Um, okay, what you have to do is you're, Spectral triple has to be regular. So this means if you take an element of your algebra A, then both A and the commutative A with D belong to the domain of all the iterators com iterated commutators with um, the absolute value of D, so the square root of D star D. Also, you have to define an algebra of sort of pseudo differential operators. The smallest algebra of linear operators 
in the domain of all the powers of the absolute value that contain both um, the elements of A and the commutators for A with D and is closed and are taken commutators with D squared. You see in a second where this is needed. And in addition for these, you consider the zeta functions that Henri Moscovici also introduced. So for an element B in this algebra, you take the trace of B e to the minus two Z for a real part of Z large. And you, you look at this thing, first it's holomorphic in a half plane, and then you can, um, in, in concrete cases, extend it meromorphically to, uh, to C. That was known in special cases. And so one assumes that this thing has simple dimension spectrum. So there exists a, a, a set F such that this thing extends meromorphically to C with at most simple poles in the set um, where you shift F by the order of B, because that's what comes up in concrete cases. And then the formula they gave was... Um, yes, right. Uh, was there a question or...? Uh, sorry, yes, could we go back to the uh, previous slide? Yeah. So in the definition of, of Psi, uh, shouldn't there be uh, a modulus of D somewhere? Not, yeah. not in the definition of uh, age infinity, but... Uh, the derivations here you mean this this should uh, uh, somehow model the algebra of pseudo differential operators or, or yeah. different you, you think at one point they should be okay it could be that i made a mistake but uh, i don't have the paper here right now okay okay uh Okay. Well, I think the point was that the operators you wrote were more like differential operators. Yes, exactly, exactly. You didn't have the inverse of D, you, know, you didn't have the parametrices because you were taking commutators with D square, which are, so this will only give you differential operators. But that's fine, I mean, because the formula, I mean, uses only that. Okay, thank you. Okay. Um, So the, the theorem of Kondoskovich says that the chain con character that was defined before has a, a nice representative given by these um, by these elements by zero, uh, psi two, psi four, and so on, where these are given by the residues of um, of zeta functions. So in this case, you take uh, the super trace it's created right of a zero d to the power two minus two z. Um, in, in the case of zero by by uh, multiplied by z to the minus one, and for the larger case by this rather more complicated formula here, um, here have the operators a zero a one up to a two k in your algebra, and you take the commutators first with D. So that's why D should all be there. And then you take from these, the commutators with D squared. So that's why you always also need those. And then you, um, you multiply the whole thing by the absolute value to this power so that you connect can actually define the residue in zero, and and that gives you the trait uh, that gives you um, this character here. And um, there's a a scalar that comes in front that is here. Okay, um, this is the abstract from that Ponch has shown has applied this to Dirac operators. There was more work for the equivariant case. Um, eventually, this was settled by Ponch and Wang. And there is also work by François Lecam, Dabrowski, Landi, um, say for, uh, um, for index formula uh, for SE2. So in our case, we do the following. Uh, we want to define a spectral triple for our algebra. So the algebra A is the algebra generated by these operators Tz. 
for that in the end, and these fractal Fourier transform for G in UN. So you can compute the R's and the G's at the expense of changing the Z. So basically you can uh, represent all these, op these operators all in, in such a form where you have the summation of AK, Z to the power K um, with AK and Z. Your Hilbert space is just L2 um, with the forms. So you have a natural grading um, by the degree of forms and even on odd forms. And the Dirac operator acts between those. So it consists of, in this case, four entries, D and D star are the usual operators on forms. And this is an operator that acts both on Rn and on the form. So you have x dx wedge and the construction, the contraction with x dx, um, which is x dx wedge star. Oh, so this act between these forms. Okay. It turns out that this is a spectral triple that meets the assumptions of Conan Moscovici. It's regular, it's fine assemblable. It has simple dimension spectrum. And in this case, in, we choose for the algebra, um, for convenience, a slightly larger algebra. So we take the algebra of all sums of operators where dk is one of the Schubin pseudo differential operators and that composed with these Tzs and the Rgs and finite sum of those. It's a little bit larger than the one required by Con Moscovici, but that makes things rather better than worse. Okay, and then after a lengthy computation, you get concrete expressions for the Con Moscovici um, co-cycles. So we do the following. Suppose we have an, an operator of this form that I just had. So a sum of those of dk's, um, uh, sorry, um, sorry, sorry, uh, a sum of this here. So if, if the aj are these operators of this form, zj, <laughs> zj are ncn and gj are unitaries, then it turns out this uh, co cycle is zero if this mapping W goes to GW plus Z has no fixed points, or K, this number here, is larger than the dimension of the fixed point space. Okay. Um, or else, if, if this does have fixed points, then you basically have to integrate a certain form over the fixed point set and add this phase factor here and the phase factor here and this factor here. <laughs> okay, let me explain a little bit what happens. So you have this TCJ and the RGJ. So you form this G by multiplying up all these GJs. And um, M in this case is the co-dimension of the fixed point set. Okay. Um, so these e to, e to the i phi are the eigenvalues of G that are different from one. So it's unitary, it has decomposition to, uh, as a diagonal, it, it has um, a representation as a diagonal matrix with different eigenvalues. So these are the non one eigenvalues with corresponding eigenvectors E sub J. Okay, and now you do something a bit more complicated, namely you multiply up the first J uh, elements of these, of these group elements and um, apply this to this set J. Um, add them up and you get the set. So this is the set that appears upstairs. Then the sigmas of the corresponding A minus IK are these forms here. So they are one forms. And so these are the one forms you put together. Um, e to the minus omega is the form constructing from the symplectic form. And the evaluation here is via the Bayesian integral 
So the Bayesian integral means you take um, an orthonormal basis, build the volume form, and then take the top coefficient of this. And these phase factors come in in addition. So it's rather concrete. Once you have an operator, you can precisely write down what it is. OK, is this helpful? Yes, we have um, rather concrete expressions in, in many cases of interest. One would be if you have a non commutative torus of any dimension. So you pick n elements in, in the complex plane that are linearly independent over Q. And um, you consider the group G, which is given from the lattice that is generated by these n vectors. And on this lattice, you have, um, okay, sorry. Um, so yeah, you have this, this lattice, and moreover, you have these shift operators, TB1 to TBN, with the corresponding com uh, commutation relations. So this is just an n-dimensional analog of the classical two-dimensional torus. For this, you have a precise expression for the um, for the churn con cycle. Another example where you can compute it explicitly are non commutative C4 orbifolds. So you take any positive K and you consider the group that is the cross product of L times C4, where L is the lattice spanned by K and IK. So just a square lattice in C with the length K. And Z4 acts on rotation by I. And so the algebra is generated by um, the operators U, that's the shift by K, the shift by I, K, and the rotation by I. This gives you the algebra. And, um, and of course, here you have the, from U and V, you have the non-commutative torus. If you compute, if you compute the uh, commutation relations, then you get the theta for the torus to be minus K squared. And on this, the RIs act. Another example would be C6 orbifolds. You do some, something similar. You start with a positive number K and uh, a vector of say 60 degrees. Um, and then you take the lattice. So it's a triangular lattice that is spanned by, by, this, uh, by K and K epsilon and C6 acts on this by rotation. So you have the algebra generated in this case by the TK, by the T epsilon K, so the, the one in the standard direction to the right and the one by the 60 degree angle, and then the rotation by 60 degrees that uh, generate your action. So again, you have here a non commutative torus from these two elements. In this time, and this time the, the theta is minus square root um, three times k squared over two, and our epsilon acts on this. Okay, I should say these. Um, I think Shakaboti and Louv has also obtained a um, local index formula for this case, but with different methods, not relying on the churn kahn cycle. Um, of course, uh, non commutatory have been studied by, uh, by Kahn. These uh, uh, orbifolds have been studied by Eshtoff, Luke, Phillips, and Walters. And there is also work by Fatisadi, Luf, Tao, and by Ponge on, um, on this. And um, Chekaboti, Luf built on this and then worked by Walters. Okay, maybe that's enough for, for this. Let me come to the trace expansions. Okay, maybe some people would say this is completely clear. Um, what we do is the following. You have one of these operators here. Um, we choose an auxiliary operator, any pseudo differential operator in the Schubin calculus of order M positive. And we assume that the principal symbol is positive and scalar. So if you have a system, um, then this would be okay. Um, but we want the principal, the, the principal symbol to be scalar. One example that you could take is just 
the um, harmonic oscillator, this operator that we had before, one half x squared minus delta. Okay, what we know in the case of H0, this is not necessary, but if you have a general operator, you might have to shift it a little bit, but then you know it's going to be invertible for all lambda in a sector, and uh, the sector can have an angle as small as you want about the positive real axis. And then what you get is the following. So that is a resolvent expansion, the spirit of the work of Gop and Seeley. So if you have a fixed U, W, and an A, and you look at the operator um, RGTWA, you multiply this by the resolvent of H, the power minus K, and the power should be so large that the whole thing is trace class, then, okay, this is just choosing this K large enough. Then it's trace class for all lambdas in the sector. Uh, moreover, this is of course meromorphic near zero. That's easy to see. And, um, and this is the more difficult part. So if you let lambda, if you let lambda, tend to infinity in the sector, then you get an expansion <clears throat> and the, the, the expansion have co has coefficient cj and then minus lambda to the power is here. And this m in this case is the complex dimension of the fixed point set of g plus the order of a, that's what always comes in, minus j, j is the running index of this sequence divided by the order of h and then you have a minus k from this k here. The, so these are the terms you probably all know, say from the classical expansion, but what sometimes doesn't happen if you just look at Laplacians or differential operators, then you don't have these terms here. So these are logarithmic terms and um, integer powers. So these might have in particular, if the order of A is non-integer, uh, just non-integer parts, but this here will also come up in general. And, uh, and these are just suitable coefficients. Okay, what turns out is that this coefficient C0 prime, so the coefficient of the log term um, with the power just minus K, so the same as this here, so the largest possible power. This independent of the choice of the auxiliary operator you choose, if it has the properties that we have. Okay. Moreover, for the zeta function, we get the corresponding expansion. And this is due to the fact that this expansion that we have for the resolvent implies um, a decay of the zeta function at infinity. Okay, so we have that the zeta function is holomorphic in a half plane, namely when the order of H times the real part of Z is larger than to N plus the order of A. It extends meromorphically to C, that's fairly easy to see, um, with poles in this, um, in this set here. And if you multiply by gamma, then you get the following pole structure. So you have the, the standard poles in these points here, plus you have double poles at the negative integers, and these additional simple poles here. And these coefficients here, um, that, oh, sorry, that, um, that we have here, they're related to the coefficients that we had before by universal constants. So essentially these two things are, um, are equivalent. And in particular, we have that the residue of the zeta function zero. So you have to take care of the, of the factor here. This is just this um, coefficient z zero prime that we have here. And it's the same as the one in the resolvent expansion. Okay. If the fixed point set of this mapping G plus W, so B goes to G, B plus W is empty, then we have no poles at all. 
And what we also have is that we have rapid decay along the vertical lines um, where, um, where, okay, where we take C, the real part of Z, um, then we look at the trace that we considered before. It has rapid decay uniformly for C in compact intervals. Okay, you have to stay a little bit away from the real axis, so you so the imagined part of that is such an one. Okay, and similarly, you have a heat trace expansion, and the fact that these three things are equivalent is a fact actually is, is a consequence of the existence of the result of the expansion, as as Kulp and Seeley have shown. So here you study the sort of the generalized heat kernel where you have e to the minus uh, th multiplied by your operator, and then you have such an expansion. Okay, so the interesting point, of course, that's clear to everybody is this residue at zero. Um, because we have a group action here, we define a localized non-commutative residue, sorry, for the localized at the conjugacy class of your group G. And the residue then is just given by the order of H. This is just to norm the whole thing, um, times the residue of the corresponding operators localized. Okay, so you just sum over those that lie in the conjugacy class of a given element. So call this element W bar G bar, then you have a localized residue at this thing by just taking those elements that um, are in the conjugacy class. Okay, and these, of course, from what we saw before, these are just the corresponding elements either in the resolvent expansion or in the zeta function expansion that you get. And um, okay, one might try to look at um, how this is. And um, okay, we try to look at a specific example um, and it turns out it's, it's rather intransparent. So you have your, your unitary and the unitary can always be diagonalized. So we assume it's diagonalizable um, and it has eigenvalues different from multiples of pi over two, call these pi one to phi m one, then it can have eigenvalues i, eigenvalues minus i, eigenvalues minus one and eigenvalues one. Okay, so this is how it generically looks. If, if it's not of this form, you can easily bring it to it, that, that's not a big problem. And then you can compute what comes out. And I wouldn't swear this formula is correct, but roughly it should be like this. So you look at the residue of this thing and what you get is essentially you integrate the minus two M5 parts. So that's the eigenspace of this thing here. So the complex dimension is M5. The real dimension is two M5. You integrate this over the cosphere of the corresponding dimension and integrate over the x and multiply by this factor here. So the factor is a bit messy. You see you the contributions the from the various parts. Uh, how do you choose the square root of i uh, one minus tangent of phi j? Uh, just from phi equal zero on, um, what you do is you do the Taylor expansion and then that gives oh, you the- uh -huh. Okay. Uh -huh. You do Taylor expansion, okay. Yeah. But, but you have to choose square root of i then. I mean, you take uh, exponential i pi over four or something like that? Um, I, I'd have to look it up. I have to paper and <laughs> Okay. Yeah. Um, okay. What, what's maybe interesting is all the, most of the trouble is caused by the simple shift here, um, you see, um, you have this, this interesting factor here that you will always have. And, and all the rest are just phase factors coming from this thing here. This, this here I've not even defined yet um, because it's, um, it's a more complicated expression than the other terms. 
But, but these are all just phase factors. And the contribution comes from this, from the eigenspace of value one. So if you, if you reduce the case where the shift vanishes, then this simplifies to this factor here. And if you simply by further that when G is one, then you just get the integral of the minus two and five term over the corresponding sphere. And this is the analog of Wojcicki's residue in the Shubin calculus. So this, in this case, the formula is certainly correct um, and it comes down to this. And so it's um, what, you, what you expect that to be true is that for every choice of a conjugacy class, this uh, localized non commutative residue is indeed a trace. And this, I should mention, is of course closely related to what Chantonu uh, Davé um, did, where he considered not these RGs, but only operators that are induced by different morphisms of the base manifold. Okay, that's it. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Elma. I, I was muted. Okay. <laughs> Thank you for this great talk. Yes. So, I mean, um, let me ask uh, if there are questions.